Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service of morning prayer. I'm delighted that you've joined us for worship today. And if you are following along in the prayer book, we'll begin on page 78. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, let us adore him. And we'll continue on page 83 with Christ our Passover. Alleluia! Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia! Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. The psalm for this morning is Psalm 146. Alleluia, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, nor in any child of earth, for there is no help in them. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps his promise forever, who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. He sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Alleluia. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, 
Be strong and do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. The second reading is from James. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, Have a seat here, please. While to the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that is evoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sins and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. 
Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, a path that, that is, be open. And immediately his ears were open. His tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, he has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome once again. So glad you're joining us for worship in this holy space today. And so today I'd like to have us look at one of the most well-known apparent contradictions in the Bible. Uh, by the way, we're continuing with our series that we started last week in James, Cultivating a Faith That Works. And so I, I say apparent Contradiction, because I think if we dig down a bit, you'll see how these passages that I'm going to quote can, in fact, be reconciled with one another. And let's start with a well-known passage, not in James, but written by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. I'm sure that's familiar with at least some of you. And here's what Paul writes. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Well, then there are these two other passages that are in James that may seem, at least on the surface, to contradict what Paul is saying there in Ephesians chapter 2. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. And then in James chapter 2, verse 24, James writes, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And Paul says our salvation is by grace through faith and not as a result of works, while James says we're justified by works and not by faith alone. So take your pick. <laughs> Who do you believe, James or Paul? Again, because on the surface, at least, for some people, they see a contradiction. And so how do we work this out? Well, as I mentioned in the message last week, if you tuned in, Martin Luther, the great reformer, really had a problem with James. So, so much so that he called the book of James an epistle of straw, which is a pretty harsh assessment of what James has to offer. Now, again, James, uh, Martin Luther didn't say that we needed to remove the book of James from the Bible, but he just felt like it didn't have much to offer Christians. Luther said that James really doesn't present us with a clear picture of the gospel. And so he was highly critical of the book of James, especially when compared with other books in the New Testament, especially the writings of Paul. And so let's look at this. Do Paul and James contradict one another? Or can these seemingly contradictory passages somehow be reconciled? Should we take our cue from Luther and say that James really doesn't have very much to offer and therefore kind of relegate the book to second class status in the canon of scripture? Are we saved by faith alone? Or are we saved by a combination of faith and works? Which is it? And I think the first thing to realize, and I think this could be easy for contemporary people to miss, is that James and Paul are writing to different audiences and they're addressing different situations. 
Both James and Paul, in their writing, stress the importance of faith. In fact, I believe they would be in complete agreement that faith in Jesus Christ is the essential element in the process of salvation. However, what James is trying to combat is this attitude that I can believe in Jesus and then just go on living my life like I please. This attitude that says I've placed my faith in Christ and so I really don't need to be concerned about doing good deeds. I can live a life that's, you know, I could total, totally dishonor God, violating God's commands and really don't have to be worried because I have this belief or I have this faith in Christ and so my salvation is secure. And do you know the great Christian pastor and theologian who was martyred by the Nazis, by the way, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, coined a term for this kind of attitude and he called it cheap grace. So here is how James argued against this kind of approach. He said, think about this. The demons and the devil, well, they believe in the Lord. <laughs> they believe in Jesus, they do. They believe 100% that Jesus is who he says he is. And so James is saying, what good does that belief do them? James says, no good. Why? Because simply believing something on an intellectual level does nothing. Our belief, our faith, if it's genuine, needs to affect our actions. And so what James is saying is that an authentic faith in Christ will produce fruit. It will affect the way we live our lives. It has to. If it doesn't, James is saying, it's simply not a genuine faith. Good works, good deeds, to one extent or another, has to follow from an authentic faith. And again, I believe Paul would agree 100%. How we live out our faith matters. And if there's no evidence of good works in our lives, then perhaps we need to re-examine our faith commitment to the Lord. So, and this, um, this will give us a kind of overview of James, which I think will be helpful here at the beginning of this series. And I'm hoping it will be at least a little bit fun. And so here is a, a question, a challenge, really. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 says, whoever says he abides in him, talking about Jesus, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And so do you? Yeah, I'm not asking you if you're perfect, like Jesus, but does your life, do your actions reflect in any way the life and character and actions of Jesus? Again, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence for judge and jury to convict you? Now, since our passage is in the book of James today and our focus is on works or deeds, let's just stay in James to see what he has to say in particular about the kind of works that spring forth from an authentic faith. In other words, this is the evidence the judge and jury can look at to convict you of being a Christian. You know, they can't see your heart, so they need to examine your life. And so here's where they start. We considered this last week in James chapter 1. It's uh, James chapter 1, 19 through 20, and then verse 26. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In verse 26, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Wow, that may seem a bit harsh. 
If a person doesn't bridle his or her tongue, their religion is worthless. But again, James is making the point that good works, good deeds, will ultimately spring forth from an authentic and genuine faith. So in this arena of life, in terms of controlling your tongue, when the judge and jury examine your words, are you found guilty of being a Christian with regard to your speech? Do you use your tongue primarily to tear down or primarily to build up? And that's the challenge I gave you for last week to, to think about what you said to people along the way. Is it encouraging or is it discouraging? Again, the judge and jury are not looking for Christ-like perfection. They're just looking to see if your speech reflects your heart and your faith. And so what's the verdict? Next, the next place, the judge and jury will look is in James chapter 2, verse 15, which says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? And this, by the way, is the specific example James provides when he talks about one way you can really tell if a person's faith is real. James is asking, do you ever do anything to help the poor, to help those in need, those who are down and out. You know, evidently, at the time, some Christians were just saying a kind of blessing over the poor. You know, be warm and well-fed. Go on your way. Be at peace. But they weren't doing anything to care for their practical needs. And James is saying our faith in this regard needs to have feet. And it needs to have hands. And the feet and hands of Christ need to be continually meeting the needs of those who are in most need, both here and around the world. And so what's the evidence in your life that you're making a difference in the lives of those in desperate need? The next place our judge and jury will look is in James chapter 4, verse 6 which says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And, and do you know the primary reason that God opposes the proud? It's because when we're prideful, what we're really doing is putting ourselves in the place of God, which is called idolatry. We're telling God that we're really fine on our own and we don't really need his help after all. You know, some over the years have called pride the root of all sin. So as the judge and jury examine your life in terms of your humility, what do they find? Again, you don't need to be perfect like the Lord. But is there enough evidence with regard to living a life of genuine humility for them to convict you of being a Christian? Next, the judge and jury will look at James 5.16, which says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power. And so what about prayer? When the judge and jury examine your life to find out if you're a person of prayer, what do they find? And I, I found over the years that sometimes people feel guilty about this. They'll say, Doug, you know, I've tried to have a, a daily prayer time, but I found that I really can't stay consistent. You know, I tried to set aside an hour each morning or each evening and read my Bible and pray, but I, I just can't keep up with it. And perhaps that's because you, you bit off more than you can chew. Now, get this. The New Testament says pray without ceasing. So if that's how we're supposed to pray, how do we do that 
especially if we can't even pray for an hour. After all, we've got so many practical aspects of life to tend to. We've got to eat, we've got to sleep, we've got to, right now, watch football, if you're, especially if you're in the Gray family. We've got to take care of our daily needs, we've got to care for our relationships with others, our families, and so how are we going to pray without ceasing? And you see, the problem is too often we compartmentalize our lives. We say, I'm going to set aside an hour over here for prayer, or this is my time to worship in the church or the chapel and really focus on the Lord. And once I've done that, once I've done my my spiritual duty, and some people actually call it an obligation, then I can focus on other things for the rest of the time. You see, we check off the God box for the day. And so now we feel we can tend to other things and a lot of times leave God out of the equation. But pray without ceasing doesn't allow us to do that. So here's the key. Pray without ceasing means that all of our time is God's time. All of our time is God's time. The challenge is to listen for God's still small voice when we're going about even the most mundane tasks of our day. The challenge is to offer up the cries of our hearts, even if it's sometimes a silent whisper to God in an instant. Perhaps as we pass somebody in the hallway or hear a conversation about someone who's in need and just shoot up a a quick short prayer. You know, when I was in college, I had this bright idea and I, I knew God would be really impressed with me if I achieved it. I got with two of my closest Christian friends and said, let's see if we can pray not just for an hour or two hours or three, but we're going to find a church or a chapel where we can stay up for the entire night and pray. And so we did that. We were exhausted by five or six in the morning, and I think our prayers were incoherent by then. But we made it the entire way. But do you know what I I know now? God was not impressed with our achievement, especially since I thought deep down praying for the entire night might give me a special badge of spiritual honor before God, and it didn't. And it doesn't. (laughs) No, God simply wants us to be consistent in communication with him. Even if that means we're just listening as we go along for God's still small voice or praying for a moment or two here or there throughout the day. So the judge and jury, when they look at your prayer life, can they tell that you're a person of prayer? who believes that God will answer your prayers. And perhaps a judge and jury wouldn't just look at the evidence of your life, but they depend on the testimony of others to find you innocent or guilty of being a Christian. And so when they ask people that you know, what's the testimony that they give about your Christian character? Friends, we all fall short. I sure know that I do. We all miss God's mark for our lives in many, many, many ways. But when others look at the evidence of your life, what does it say about you? Most importantly, what does it say about the quality and character of your faith? Are you innocent or are you guilty of being a Christian? In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we'll continue in the prayer book with the first song of Isaiah. It's on page 86. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense and he will be my savior. Therefore, you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. 
And on that day you shall say, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things. And this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion, ring out your joy. For the great one in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. And we'll continue with the song to the Lamb. It's on the bottom of page 93. Splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord our God. For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb that was slain. For with your blood you have redeemed for God from every family, language, people, and nation, a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And so to him who sits upon the throne and to Christ the Lamb, be worship and praise, dominion and splendor forever and forevermore. And then the Song of the Redeemed, Canticle 19. O ruler of the universe, Lord God, great deeds are they that you have done, surpassing human understanding. Your ways are ways of righteousness and truth, O King of all the ages. Who can fail to do you homage, Lord, and sing the praises of your name? For you only are the Holy One. All nations will draw near and fall down before you, because your just and holy works have been revealed. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. The Apostles' Creed on page 96. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And may we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And suffrages be. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts, for as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, show you never, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, the King Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning, drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep your law, 
and guide our feet into the way of peace that having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may when night comes rejoice to give you thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O oh God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, and all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget you but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The prayer list for this morning, we pray for the, the Church of the Cross in Columbia and Holy Cross in Simpsonville. We also pray for the Church of the Province of Myanmar. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you all those who have died, that their deaths may recall for us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. We pray for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God Rest in peace. Amen. Amen. From our chapel prayer lift list, we lift up Retta Miller, Marcine Thompson, Kendall Corley, Wayne Corley, Nancy Malding, Lindsay Presley, Eve Daniel, Betsy Oakman, Harriet Strait, Marilyn Sirigatis, Margaret Payne, Bob Malinuk, Dawson Scrivener, Andrew Kramarchik, Shirley Kuyper, John and Suzanne Wall, Don Wiseman, Gail Belvin, Elizabeth Harris, Tricia Gray, Dorothy Blondin, Bob Rimbo, Safety for the Staff of Still Hopes, Protection for the People of Ukraine, and peace and healing in the Middle East. We pray for the safety of our military, remembering especially Brian Dugan, Edward and Katie Cloyd, Thomas Smith, Alexander, Isaac, Natalie, and Gavin White. We pray for those celebrating birthdays this week, Gail Kennard, Ben Franklin, Elizabeth Glazebrook, Eleanor Whitehead, Jewel Hill, Ruth Marcus, Elaine Hunter, Eugene Zentz. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. The general thanksgiving is found on page 101. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service 
and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.